I like the fact that people have been toying with the idea of an authentic self. We've heard it ripple down the line and so on. I think in Shakespeare's case, it has to be authentic selves. Uh, he is a chameleon. What is the chameleon's authentic color? Um, Shakespeare in one of his sonnets says his nature is subdued to what it works in like the dyer's hand. The man or woman who dyes fabrics all day, the hand will be colored the color of the dye being worked on. A different dye, a different fabric, a different color. But we all, I think, at the back of our minds would like the real Shakespeare to stand up and uh, identify uh, himself or himself. So we're happy to say that it isn't Earl of Oxford uh, who died. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. But what we do know is for whatever reason, maybe because the play was written in 1611, we think, we'd like to think that it is Shakespeare's farewell to the stage as a playwright, the last play that he wrote by, just by himself. And we search for signs that um, he is giving some sort of signature. He's hiding it somewhere, but not hiding it very well. He wants it to be found. And the character, of course, who is identified with Shakespeare is Prospero, the consummate stage manager, behind the scenes worker of everything. And uh, I have to say, there's a particular joy in having Dennis Arndt return to the stage at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival to play Prospero. Um, and uh, I can't tell you the sort of magnificent ripples it sends through the newbies who don't know him or don't know his uh, Shakespearean work to those of us who have seen his King Lear and the Iceman Cometh and Coriolanus and Wild Oats and you can just go on and on. And he's brought all of his magic in his mid-70s uh, for the role of Prospero. Uh, a role that perhaps Shakespeare played himself before he retired to Stratford. A desert island. What is a desert island doing with the name Tempest? The Tempest is the first scene. It's a shipwreck and very well done on our stage. Ropes coming down, ladders coming down from spaces above. I didn't even know existed in the Bomer Theater and uh, people clamoring up those ladders. But after the first scene subsides, we have the island. And this is what the play was called in its 17th century adaptations. And on the island uh, are denizens, uh, Caliban, a savage and deformed slave, says the folio, the first printing in 1623 of this marvelous play, a play whose Primacy is seen by appearing at the very beginning of the 36 plays, even though it might have been Shakespeare's last. And also on the island, serving Prospero as well as Caliban serving Prospero, is an airy spirit called Ariel. And our island is undistinguished. It is a bare stage, an undulating stage, a stage with a little tip at one end, which some people call the Dorito chip, uh, used a marvelous comedic effect. And uh, people see on this island what they want to see. It's a vast mirage. Again and again, characters say, can I believe my eyes? And they can't. Um, but the bare stage, of course, is what Shakespeare has used uh, throughout his career, a place where the imagination and the power of, of language make a local habitation and a name. It actually, not just comedy of errors at the beginning of his career, but Midsummer Night's Dream, we think of elves and fairies and supernatural beings, uh, denizens of this uh, area. Um, 
people always ask, when are we going to see Shakespeare in authentic costumes, whatever that means? Well, this is the sort of costume and swords and the sort of things that Shakespeare's actors would have had. So we do get um, that sense of a Renaissance world. The play itself, probably written, I think I mentioned, in 1611, towards the end of his career. But however you cut it, um, there was a shipwreck about the time that Shakespeare was writing this play. And it could have been serendipity that what Shakespeare was writing about was very much on everybody's mind. A ship going to Virginia with planters uh, gets wrecked in the Bermuthies, the Bermudas, and magically, a year later, uh, finds uh, its way into Virginia. I just read in the paper today about somebody on a desert island for a year eating tortoises, so there you go. Uh, a word must, I think what deeply concerns, in fact, I know what deeply concerns Tony and what he's talked uh, about many times to the cast is the difficult endeavor of true forgiveness. Uh, Prospero, what happened a dozen years before this play starts is the huge wheel that moves everything. And what happened was Prospero was taken away from the dukedom of Milan by his own brother, a brother that he loved more dearly than anybody else in the world except for his infant daughter, Miranda. And this brother sold out the kingdom to Alonzo, the king of Naples. So all of these 12 years, and why did this happen? Just what Louis was saying, it was the last time somebody could know everything that was happening. And Prospero wanted to be that person. He secluded himself in his library, left matters of state to Antonio, his brother, and didn't have an inkling what was going on until probably the very moment he was supplanted. This has stayed in the recesses of Prospero's mind ever since. Prospero is almost paranoid now about plots against him, whether they be by the shipwrecked enemies of his that were um, a dozen years before, or about a, a drunken butler and clown, or even his arch enemy Alonzo's son, Ferdinand, who lands on the island and finds Miranda very attractive. All of these happenings do not sit well with Prospero because he realized when he was getting all that book learning that he was missing something vital about human interaction. And he's, this is his new education and his new fear. And so at the end of the play, it reminds me so much of Midsummer Night's Dream when Puck comes out. If we be friends, give me your hands. Prospero also asks for hands of the audience at the end of the play, but hands that might be coming together in prayer. Because without that, he says his ending is despair. So it's a very, very different uh, conclusion to a magical play. <laughs> The Tempest is a very large storm. Uh, it might be the Tempest in Prospero's mind. It, it might be. Uh, but what is, what is for sure, Prospero is a magician. Like Shakespeare, he has waked the dead and made them walk. He has taken Henry V from the grave and Julius Caesar and all of these other characters and made them walk. And he's in danger if he continues with his magic. He might be termed a black magician, which is damnable, uh, death inviting versus a white magician. But serendipity again, serendipity. By fortune, by chance, a storm, a tempest has brought his enemies to his island. And that's not enough. If it weren't for an auspicious star that is just in the right place at the right time, none of his magic can work. And I think without deep changes in himself, none of this magic can work. But the word again is forgiveness. Forgiveness.